Hello and welcome to the November edition of Turf Moor. As we head into another international break, we've got a packed show for you. We meet the North American Clarets in Washington DC for the match against Chelsea. Coach Billy Mercer lifts the lid on his career and Burnley's goalkeeping department. Our attention shifts to New Zealand v Ireland with Kiwi coach Danny Hay, Chris Wood and Jeff Hendrick. And we get to know Burnley women's manager Matt B a little bit more. With such a rich history, it's little wonder that Burnley's name is now worldwide. We had the chance to catch up with the North American Clarets recently in Washington as they gathered to watch the Clarets take on Chelsea. Mike Jones, I'm from uh, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, I'm one of the founding members of North American Clarets. We organize this get together in Washington, DC. We get together about two or three times a year. Usually have a really good group, have a lot of fun, talk about all things Burnley, and it's great to watch the games. I've been a Burnley fan since I was born in uh, Burnley General Hospital. My dad used to watch in the 50s when, you know, in the heydays, moved over to America when I was 20. You know, the first few years it was uh, watching on, you know, like teletext kind of things, but now you can watch every game. Premier League's getting really big over here now, so. But I can remember days going to Rochdale and Hereford and places like that, and now watching the lads playing in Europe, fantastic. Pulisic in the box, looking to take on Tarkovsky and scores. It's a great finish from the American. I think it was 2009 we got together in North Carolina when the Clarets played down in Kerry. But Gian, who's here today, he was there too. Since then, we just got a Facebook group together. We're going up to Minnesota in May, and Adrian Heath's the, the head coach there. And the guy who owns the pub's a Burnley fan, so that should be a pretty special occasion. Someone's hoping to get with Adrian Heath to get him to come to, the, to meet up with us. That'd be pretty good if he could. Pulisic looking to take on Tarkovsky, shot into the goal, might have been a deflection. Hi, I'm Dave, uh, I follow up Burnley, I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I met the ultimate Burnley fan, Michael, over here uh, when we were working in Hanover, Pennsylvania, and uh, we just started a conversation because of the football. And he's like, hey, I'm a Burnley fan, I'm like, you know what, you're my, you're my buddy, you're my, you're my bro, you know. So we were kind of like, all right, man, I'm going to follow your team. And then we've gone and talked about it and all that stuff. We've followed them ever since. And, um, you know, probably about three or four years ago, we went over to England and stuff like that and went and saw a, a Burnley game. These mini meetups and stuff like that, and the meetups that Mike is putting together for North America and all that stuff is amazing. And it's been a really great gathering of bringing people together. And who's your favorite Burnley play? Actually, Barnes, of course. <laughs> I just... I just like his attitude on the field. He's very, uh, doesn't take any guff. He's, you know, he's out there, business and stuff like that. And I've seen some of his antics and I'm like, I can get behind this guy. <laughs> Option on again for Rodriguez. We've done a show. Oh, the ball. John Rodriguez from distance. My name is Ben Jordan. I'm the manager of the Airedale in Washington, D.C. And I'm a lifelong Chelsea fan. I had always wanted to run a soccer bar. I had been a teacher at high school for many years. I taught vocational education, and um, I got kind of tired of uh, doing something for such a long time. It always been my dream ever since I was a kid. I've been a Chelsea fan my entire life, and my dad also is a big fan, and so it's been something I wanted to do my entire life. And I got the opportunity, so I just took the leap and went ahead and did it. My mom and dad met um, in uh, a exchange program in Earl's Court, and so um, I became interested in Chelsea as a kid uh, because they were they played in that area. And Rude Gullet, I found out about him, and weren't a lot of players when I grew up that looked like me. And so I was like really, really into that. We have um, a regular Chelsea group of these guys here, um, which is a small group uh, from DC that come in. Uh, we have a regular Arsenal group and Bruce Dortmund as well. 
we're starting to see a lot of people with um, like regularly we have like two or three guys that come in for Sheffield United this year um, and people come in for Huddersfield um, and people come in for a lot of the smaller teams which is something you never used to see it used to be Chelsea, Liverpool, Man City, Man United I'd say that it's now the point where the Premier League is, is definitely outpaced uh, uh, the MLS in terms of interest He's sent to midfield Brady at the minute here's McNeil looks to have a shot yeah. Hey, I'm Harrison. I follow Bully from Washington, D.C. Well, you don't normally expect extra time to really do too much for you when you're down by full, but that was really something to see in the last few minutes. And you guessed the time of the first goal to win the last year? <laughs> the wrong team, though. You know, it's, it's always something, you know, I, I was hoping when I said 20 minutes, it would be Bully schooling at 20 minutes, not them, but, you know. My dad, I mean, he was born in England. Uh, he was born, I, I think I remember him saying his mom went in the label maybe at a soccer game. So I, I think it's in my blood, you know, it's, it's really in my blood. <laughs> as far away as we all from Bullingley, it's still great to have that connection to that place, you know. That's the final whistle. Finished here, Burnley 2, Chelsea 4. Since joining the club in 2010, Billy Mercer has helped develop some fantastic shot stoppers. Pete Oliver took the chance to sit down with the goalkeeping coach to take a close look at the men between the sticks. Bill, nearly 10 years at Burnley Football Club, great service on that side of the game. You had a lengthy playing career. Goalkeeping coach, how has it varied? You start off at Liverpool, a massive club. Did you even have a goalkeeping coach when you started? No, um, back, back at Liverpool, that was 1986. Um, it was just a case of getting warmed up amongst yourselves, really, and then, and then joining the main group. So no, it was, um, it was only until I went to Rotherham. Where Alan Hodgkinson, Alan Hodgkinson, sorry, he came in one day a week, right? Um, and he used to just take us for one day, and that was it. And yeah, I was going to ask where it first started, where it started to get phased in. But you, you played at Chesterfield as well, as we know, with the manager. Well, that was a real hotbed of goalkeepers going back. But again, as you say, probably at that stage, goalkeeping coaches weren't there either. No, I mean um, the the backup goalkeeper at the time was a guy called Andy Leenan, who was yes. a bit yeah. older than me at the time. So he played at York City, I remember. That's Andy, right, and yeah. he he doubled up as um, a coach as well. Right. So he used to take me. Yeah. before training so yeah. that was that was it then at what point did you think about becoming a goalkeeping coach um, when i was injured at bristol bristol yeah. city um i used to take the kids over night time just to, i was really frustrated that i weren't playing so i started coaching and it was then that i felt that I, I got the bug and you know it was something that i really wanted to step into but yeah. it wasn't that easy to get into we sort of know what makes a good goalkeeper although that role has changed massively over the years what mm. do you think makes a good goalkeeping coach i think empathy i think if yeah. you've been in that position and you you know you know what the lads are going through i mean albeit i never played at, in the premier league um but i know what it's like to stand in between the goals and mm. and be under pressure and play good and play mm. bad mm. um so i think if you can empathize with them that is a, is a big big plus but you've seen massive changes even in your 10 years at this club, I imagine, in so many different ways. You came here, of course, from Sheffield Wednesday in 2010, mm. and you've been here since, worked under three different managers, which is testament to yourself, a good job you do. How do you sort of sum up those changes you've seen? It's difficult, because when, they, when a manager brings you into a club mm. um, and then he, he leaves for whatever reasons, you, you don't know what the next guy is going to want, whether he's going to bring his own guy in. So mm. I just I just bury my head down in, in, my, in my work. Yeah. And if it's good enough for the, the manager, then great, you know. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I understand football, I understand yeah. how it works. But I think if you do your best and you're honest, then it's a good start point. And Burnley is now famous for its goalkeepers again. Going back in time a little bit, when you first came in, we had Brian Jensen sort of established number one who had been part of the furniture <coughs> year and, and a great goal could in his own right. Yeah, I mean, Brian was fantastic for the football club um, and there was Diego Penny here at the time yes. when I first got here. Um, but no, Brian, Brian done ever so well, um, but the game moves on and you know you know what it's like, you, you have to be looking for the next yeah. one coming yeah. in. Yeah. So we were always putting that in place. Yeah. Um, and I think with Lee Grant was the next one yeah, in after, yeah, after, after Brian. Yeah, top goalkeeper. Uh, and that was real good competition between mm -hmm. the two of them because uh, Lee, Lee did well for us. Yeah. Um, and then when Lee left, then 
Tom came yeah. in, Tom Eaton, yeah. and then the rest just, just flows. Yeah, so Tom came in, he was the manager's first signing, and, yeah. and obviously was, was a super player for this club, and became an England international. Again, what pride do you get out of that? We had an England international forever, and then mm. suddenly we were two and three around the place, but mm. uh, that must be nice. No, it was, it was massive for us all, um, because at, at that time we started getting um, trips, had moved on, but then got in the squad, yeah. Ingsy and Michael Keane, and, and people like that, Jack Cork got called up. So mm. as a staff, we were absolutely delighted, you know, to see him. Because if, if we're doing well as a team, then ultimately, individually, someone's going to get uh, an accolade, and, and that was it. But with Tom, it was it was a great journey for him because yes, um, yes. he'd been to a lot of clubs on loan. Yes. Um, he pl played uh, number two at Cardiff for quite a while. Yeah. So what an, what a story that's been for him yeah. as well. Yeah, and it's funny in in, in, all, in sport, in all types of sport, you think someone will be there forever. But just again, evolution for whatever reason. Nick yeah. Pope comes in. A lot of people, you know, certainly in the top flight, not really heard of Nick Pope. You put a lot of faith in him. You, you worked with him for a year or so ago. Chance out of nowhere and never look back. Yeah, I mean, going back to what I said earlier, uh, only one can play. Yeah. But you've got to try and make them ready. Um, so when the chance comes, they take it. And Nick did that. Um, yeah. I mean, it was awful for Tom. Yeah. Uh, he was in the England squad and then he dislocated his shoulder. And you never really know until they go in and, and what happens. And, and people always say to me, what's one of the best saves you've ever seen? And I always say the, the save Nick made against Crystal Palace. Yes. And it was a foot save. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a great Benteke, save. Wasn't it it was. Yeah, yeah. But that goes in, you know, they draw level. Then all of a sudden the game changes. You yeah. might lose the game. And then the second game he, he started yeah. was at Anfield. Yeah. And he goes yes. to Anfield and he had a world. world mm. So yeah. now it's... Um, it's been it's been really good uh, working with them guys. Because then we had Joe Hart as well, top top goalkeeper, 75 caps for England, one of the best. Anders Lindegaard in international his own right. I mean, a sport for choice in many ways at, yeah. at one point, weren't we? Yeah, it shows has been incredible yeah. since he's been here. Yeah. Really unlucky to come out the yeah. side. Yeah, um, a good pro, Ali. <coughs> he? Oh, yeah. he is what he is. Yeah, he's yeah. just a top professional yeah. and, a, and a real nice bloke. Yeah. But um, when he when he came out the side, I mean, if if we'd have done an off season play of the year. I think personally he may have got it, yeah, yeah, albeit yeah. we were getting beat a lot, yeah. but he was performing really well and you know he was making some top class saves, so yeah, really unlucky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was upset when he got left out, but did it affect his training? No. Mm. He was he was there for Nick and he's been he's been different class. Yeah. So how do you feel that looking back ten years to where you are now, A how your role has evolved and, and, and the club as a whole? Because when you came in we're in the Premier League, but in some ways without being rude, it perhaps wasn't a Premier League club at the time, was it? It yeah. feels like that now. Oh, you only have to drive over the bridge on a morning yeah. and it, you know, you have to pinch yourself from what we had back then, which was the, the old building. Mm. And um, we were getting in our cars at TAFE to drive up, getting yeah. back in your car full of mud and, yeah. and you come to this facility now and it's just incredible. I mean, you know, the ground has had little tweaks done to it as well, but the playing squad, the, the management, the, the academy, yeah. it's just growing and it's, it's, it's brilliant to see. And you can watch an extended version of that interview on Claret's Player. Speaking of goalkeepers, we pulled some top saves from the archives. And it's a solid header, one of a save from Jensen. It was Mensa who got up. It's a fabulous save from Brian Jensen. I'm surprised if you see a, a better save anywhere this weekend. How did he keep that out? Altador, nicely done. It's Josie Altador blocked by Jensen. Well, how important might this save be from Jensen? Absolutely superb. Chance to make it 2-2. Davis against Grant. Oh, the save! He's gone past him the opposite way. Sticks out an arm. It's a magnificent save. Good cross in there, looking for Austin. Oh, the save to his left-hand side. That's a top save to deny Charlie Austin. What a save that is from Tommy. Looked all over a goal. Good ball in. And a one. Oh, what a save from Heaton. Oh, what a save to Heaton. Cosgrove, what a save. Lindergaard to his left hand side. Cosgrove won the header. Through the middle, then Teke. Oh, what a save from Nick Cole. 
Hooks it back towards the back post. Chance here. Real save from Polk to his left hand side. Ball inside. Chance here. Shot on target. Oh, what a save from Nick Polk to his right hand side. Chance here. Good save, Nick Polk. Moving to his left hand side. It's inside the box now, Josh Sims. But they need to stop him. He's only in the post. Outside of the box. Nick Polk saved that. Nick Polk has saved that. That is a save from Nick Polk. Wow. With another international break upon us, there's one fixture that Burnley fans will definitely want to keep their eye on. And ahead of New Zealand's matchup with Ireland in Dublin, we caught up with New Zealand head coach, Danny Hay. Hi Danny, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you. Don't often have a national coach among us, but you're down at Barnfield today in Turf Moor tomorrow. Just explain what you've come to see and what you've come to learn. Yeah, look, I thought it was uh, important that uh, I got, got myself in front of the manager, in front of Sean Dyche. Uh, Obviously, I want to have a good relationship with him. Chris Wood, is, as you know, will be, is vitally important for our national team. Uh, I know he's a big part of, of the club here as well. So just want to make sure that um, I'm building a, a good relationship with the manager, um, that he's very clear about uh, our intentions with, with Chris and that we can work together for the betterment of the player. And what have you made of A, the place, and, and B, the sort of staff and the environment that you've come into today? Yeah, look, that that's sort of hasn't been lost on me straight away, blown away by uh, the quality of the personnel. I think that, uh, that's the one thing that uh, I think organisations are built on, and it's good people. And I think that's very clear that uh, the manager uh, and his staff uh, clearly are doing a fantastic job, and the type of players as well uh, that are within the environment, I think, um, well, it's no surprise that the team is rolling along as well as they are and have done for so many years. And, and we sort of know Woody here, but also watch afar his international commitments. He's very big to Burnley Football Club. How big is he to New Zealand football? Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's aware that we don't have a huge wealth in terms of players playing at the highest level. So he is one of the few and, uh, and obviously has been playing uh, at a good level for a number of years. So he's hugely important to the national team. Uh, we've got a lot of younger players that are going to be making their debut over the sort of next six to 12 months. So his influence and ability to lead uh, and drive the culture within the team is going to be huge. Um, look, I think he holds what we would call in New Zealand a lot of mana, a lot of respect yeah, yeah, amongst yeah. the playing group. Um, so the fact that he can be coming into international windows for us is, is really important. Robbie Brady very politely held the door open for you down there and he came through. You might be playing against him next Thursday night. Yeah, well, so it was so generous when, yeah. if he's got the Irish shirt on. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a, look, it's a, great, it's a great fixture for us. Yeah. Uh, the ability to play against Ireland, um, you know, and Dublin as well, I think is big. It's, uh, we, don't, we don't often get the chance to play against such good quality sides. Uh, being based down in Oceania, it's, we're, we're a little bit like being on the moon in many respects. We're quite removed from, I guess, the footballing hotbeds. But uh, look, it's a good chance, like I say, for the players to actually show what they're capable of against good quality opposition. Um, and Lithuania will be no different as well. You know, they're playing you know, week in and week out, a lot of their players at a, at a decent level. Um, and then obviously as a national team, they're getting challenged often in terms of their qualifying. So for us, big step up, um, but something that I'm sure the players will really uh, thrive in. Where does it live in the national landscape, the football in New Zealand? Because of course, rugby union is the number one sport. The cricket team is fantastic at the moment. Where, where does football live? Yeah, look, it's, it's in a funny place at the moment. The national team hasn't played for a long time. Uh, that said, if you look at junior playing numbers, uh, football is killing it. So most people think that uh, whilst you know, rugby is our national sport, it's actually football in terms of sheer numbers and registered players that is by far and away uh, ahead of every other sport. So uh, there's, some, there's some real ground being um, broken there in terms of those numbers. I think they just need to see a pathway. Uh, and they need to have a national team that they can be proud of and they want to play for themselves. So, look, that's, uh, that's part of my job, essentially, as I see it, is uh, getting the, the national team back to where I think they can be capable of. And ultimately, that's qualifying for World Cups and uh, making, making the country proud. Your country played in the World Cup in 1982 and then again in 2010 in South Africa when Chris Wood played as a teenager. Mm -hmm. I know, speaking to him earlier in the week about the game coming up, he'd love to play in another World Cup. I mean, that's got to be the big aim. It's not easy for you to yeah. qualify. It's quite a big process, isn't it? But there is. as you say, that, that is the goal and I know yeah. Chris would love to be there, wouldn't he? Yeah, look, 2022, we've got to have something that we've, we've got to aim for. 
Uh, and that's that's the ultimate. I think that's the pinnacle of uh, probably any footballer's career is getting to a World Cup where you know that you're playing against the best players in the world and being challenged by that. Uh, and we've also got players like like Chris who may have one World Cup, two World Cups left in them, Winston Reid or others. Uh, there's a few of those players in, in their early 30s now that really this could be the last chance for them. So it's a, it's a massive chance for them to try and get back onto that, uh, onto that stage. Yeah, really looking forward to the challenge. Um, been blown away by just how uh, excited and passionate the players are about the opportunity to get their, uh, get their national team shirt back on. So great challenge first up against Republic of Ireland. Well, I wish you well and you'll have some supporters from afar because we're certainly following yourself and Chris Wood. Thanks very Good much. On you. Thank you, appreciate it. And ahead of Thursday's Friendly, we caught up with Chris Wood and Jeff Hendrick, two of the four Burnley internationals who could be involved in the game. Chris Wood's got it this time! Oh, how about that from Jeff Hendrick! For one week only, you're going to be on the opposite side of the fence, Ireland against New Zealand. Your perspective first, Chris, where is it at in the New Zealand calendar? And, and Look, it's, it's very early on in our process, we've got a new manager. Um, seven new players into the squad um, that haven't had an appearance, um, could make the debuts. So it's going to be a, a tough one for us all to gel together so quickly with the, the game coming around on a Thursday. But it'll be not just nice to be back together as a, as a squad and as a team. It's slightly different for you, Jeff. You were one game away from a massive game for you. Is, is this a sort of warm-up for Ireland ahead of the Denmark game, which is massive for you? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit weird having the friendly before. Uh, you know, The way they've been doing it lately is the friendlies after. And, the manager has gave game time to, to the players who haven't played, so um, it'd be interesting because you don't want to pick up any injuries going into the, such a big game. So I don't know what way the, the manager will go about it, but uh, we're looking forward to, to meeting up again. It's a big week in Dublin, isn't it? Because both games are in Dublin, and I imagine the atmosphere. It's always a big week in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the Denmark is huge for you, isn't it? But I, so. New Zealand would be a great game in itself as it a friendly, but this, what will the mood be like in the city sort of wrapped around the two games? Uh, yeah, I think it'll be very positive. Um, it's, it's on a Monday night, so uh, I don't think that will make a difference really uh, with how big the game is, but um, the supporters will be there. They're out in force every game, and I'm sure it'll be a sellout. Um, so just looking forward to it really. You've played in the World Cup Finals, Chris. You've played in the European Championships, Jeff, and you're one game away from another one. If you could beat Denmark, you, you would get there. What, what would that mean to you? It'd be unbelievable. Um, we've got a new squad, um, a few of us who have been there to the last Euros. We, we're trying to tell the, the new lads that uh, the feeling you get when, when you qualify is, is unbelievable and it's something you won't forget. So, you know, uh, just give it everything and, and, and try and get that feeling. And, for us who, who've had it already, we want to go and play in another tournament. Mm. Was France 2016 one of the highlights of your career? I think we've had to say, you, yourself and Robbie, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, we were with each other maybe for six six weeks, I think it was. And when it was over, it was you know, such a come down, really. Uh, it just felt weird. That was that was our life for six weeks, just sitting around each other, the, the training games, just a bit of banter around it, and the feeling in France. You know, we're seeing videos of, of fans mingling and, and how much of a good time they were having and then we had some great results as well which, which made it even better. The Ireland sort of get two bites of the cherry, Chris, they've got the Euros and the World Cup for yourself, it's just the World Cup really, but how big a deal is that on the New Zealand thing? I mean, you, the country's qualified before of course and that's not easy for you because it's a really long process and you nearly got there last time, didn't you? Yeah, we, we have a harder one, roundabout way of having to win our, our continent uh, games first and then going on onto a playoff match um, and that's decided very late in the process who we have to play off against um, so yeah it makes it a little bit harder but at the end of the day it's the same same every single four years that we have to focus on and do um, so it'll be nice to, to get back to another World Cup if we can um, just a, a long process in the making. Yeah you were a teenager in South Africa weren't you in playing the World Cup what would it mean to you to, to get there again sort of later in your career? It would be fantastic I think you can probably appreciate it more I think when I was young um, you just go through the motions you think this is normal because you're 18 you're early on the scene in football in terms and you, you're playing a World Cup you think oh this is great this is this is normal, but uh, you find out later on in your career it's, it's an extremely hard thing to get to. And uh, if I could get back there, you'd take a bit more appreciative of it. 
And normally you're flying halfway in the world for the game. How nice will it be just to nip over the Irish Sea to, to Dublin? It's fantastic. I'm popping up to Jess for Sunday lunch on Sunday. I'm, I'm expecting the full works coming in. Yeah, I'll look after you, don't worry about that. I'm looking after him all the time, so it's, it's not new Irish to Irish breakfast, I think that's is the key, that, isn't it? On match day. I've got, I've got some things I need to try out there, apparently. So, uh, um, yeah, it's going to be good. It's, it's nice that it's only a short hop over, over the sea now, which is nice, a little 40-minute flight. So uh, it's uh, nice compared to what I normally have to go through. Just lastly to you both, what does it mean to play for your country? I mean, for you, Chris, over 50 caps, 20 odd goals. Not easy to play on the other side of the world, but when you do pull on that all-white shirt, what does it mean? Look, it means a lot to me. Um, it's something I've dreamt of as a kid, being, being one of the, the record holders going forward. I've got goals and aspirations to achieve a lot more in, in the white shirt. So, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I, I love doing it, and it's been a long time coming since the last one. And finally, Jeff, you over 50 caps for yourself must be very proud. I know you're proud Irishman, and rightly so. What would it mean? A, what does it mean to keep playing for the country, and what would it mean to get to the Euros if you could get past Denmark? Yeah, like I said, massive to get to any major tournament. Um, you know, as a kid, you grow up, and th that's what you want to do. Um, you've nothing else in your mind other than playing for your country, and obviously it's playing in the Premier League. But you think it's easily done when you're a kid. But then, as the years go on and you get older, you you find out it is a hard thing to do. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a big thing for me, definitely. Well, I hope you two draw and then I hope you beat Denmark. Wish yeah. you well and thanks for your time. Cheers. Thanks, thanks Cheers. Pete. The men's team are used to lifting titles here at Turf Moor and the Burnley FC ladies are following suit. We sat down with manager Matt B to talk about the women's game. Yeah, she would have the mic first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. All good. <laughs> Okay, and now, so in celebration of Women's Football Weekend, um, we do a feature called Getting to Know with the, the Burnley FC women players. Yeah. So that's in the Matchday programmes on the website, I'm sure you've seen it. So uh, we're going to take the opportunity to ask you a few, a few questions so people can get to know you. So they're right. all women's football related, so you don't have to worry too much. Uh, so first one, if you could play any women's team in any division at the moment, who would it be? I'd have to say Arsenal. I've always been an Arsenal supporter since I was young, so I'd have to say Arsenal women. Um, and the fact that they're doing very well and obviously have, have won the WSL last year, um, but obviously the, the little link obviously from being a, a supporter, um, I'd have to say Arsenal. OK, and which women's uh, team manager in any, any division do you most admire? I think probably Emma Hayes at Chelsea. Yeah. Um, just because of watching a lot of the interviews and, and certainly a lot of the stuff she does on Sky Sports, on the debate and different shows like that, I think the way she comes across is, is interesting and, and the way she talks about the game and, um, and obviously what she's achieved at Chelsea as well uh, is, is fantastic. Um, so I'd probably say certainly the women's game, uh, Emma Hayes. OK, and if you could sign uh, any women's player to play for Burnley at the moment, who would you sign? Any women's player. I'd probably say Medima at Arsenal, not just because she's at Arsenal, but just looking at the, the amount of goals she scored last year in the WSL. Um, yeah, I'd have to say her. Um, Lucy Bronze as well is obviously a phenomenal player, but I'd probably say Medima. And what is your favourite footballing moment in the women's game? I think the overall. Overall, um, women's game, I'd probably say the, the Women's World Cup from the summer and, and certainly the just seeing the buzz around it. Obviously, when, when we got USA and you could tell that women's football has arrived and you could tell that women's football was something that was being taken seriously by not just people that have watched it in the past, but but everyone um, was behind it. You know, I, I um, put a little tweet out and, and was I was in... Greg's, where I usually stop off for my coffee in the morning. Um, and there was people there just talking about it in the queue. You could hear them talking about the game, talking about how well the, the team was, was doing. Um, and, and I think that, would, that was quite a, a nice moment. Obviously, for me, working in the women's game, it was quite a nice moment, because you always hear when you're, you know, wherever you are about Liverpool and Man City going head-to-head -head, uh, or whatever it might be. But, but for the women's game, that was quite a nice moment. So I would say that. And so if you could uh, think of three words that you think the players would use to describe you, what three words do you think they'd use? <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to know, to no. be honest. <laughs> probably wouldn't want to know. Um, 
I think driven would be one in terms of I always try and well, I'd like to think it is <laughs> um, where I always try and demand a standard from them and from myself um, to make sure that that we're pushing on to, to be the best that we can be every week. Um, I'd probably say tactical because of the fact that I love the tactical side of the game. Uh, I love studying it and watching it, um, not just in the women's game, but obviously the men's game as well. And, and love coming here on a Saturday and watching the game from a different team, both teams play and how they're operating. So I just enjoy the tactical side of the game. Um, so I'd like to think it's that, you know, we always try and put that into our training sessions so they know what we're trying to do from a tactical perspective. I'd probably say a lot of players would say defensive as well because of how I look to set the team up and, and look to make sure that we're disciplined without the ball. I'm sure some of them would probably have a few other choice words to, to throw in the mix <laughs> there, but I'd probably say they're the three, they're the three that I'd like to think. But yeah, you'll have to ask them probably that one. That's probably one for another another time. Yeah, we'll get their insight. Great, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. That's yeah, good. That's brilliant. And that's it for another edition of Turf Moor. Thanks for joining us. The Clarets are back in action at Watford next weekend in a game that has only produced two goalless draws in 43 meetings. Goals seem certain. See you soon. Gumson to triangle a ball. Chance to left. It's fallen for Arfield. Can he finish? It's it. it can. Scott Arfield with the finish. Paul Weller. Great ball in for Little. Oh, the goal. Glenn Little. Might fall here for Gray, won't it? Fall here for O'Connor. Shot from O'Connor. He's gone. Oh, what a good second debut. Fox first touch. Yes! Fox on Fox. Chance for Blake. It's there. Robbie Blake. Ball right into the mix. Burnley win the header. A target in. And the Clarets lead. I think it's Jeff Hendrick. Well, it's trying to dig one out. Has he found Tracy Farpout? He has. Keith Tracy. Swung in. It's a dangerous one. Right one there to the bottom. Target. Yeah!